Hey, everybody, it's the Drive School Podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, David Zilt. How's it going, friend? I'm doing okay. Good. It's nicer weather. It feels like summer. Um, it reminds me of finals week in college. It's like that time when I'm like, have to study for a test, but I just want to like goof off. Yeah, you've got some old trauma there to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and work's been stressful, so it's a little bit. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I found your PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, uh, I want to change gears radically on you um, and, and hope I can drag you along for something. Uh, we are, as higher things, we're not a political organization, but I want to talk politics. Um, not because I, I, I want to tell you who to vote for or anything like that, but in the same sort of ways that that uh, when we've dealt with deconstructionism, use the word as we were talking before this tribalism. Uh, tribalism is a big thing among the deconstruction movement. You are you are an ex evangelical, or you are holding the the bulwark against the unbelievers. Um, and, and in the same way, uh, politics has become such a binary, such a divisive thing that uh, in the same way we have just sort of used common sense and thought through deconstruction, maybe we could apply just a little bit of that to, to how to deal with politics in America today. What do you think? Well, you know, we've, we've talked, we've kind of beaten deconstruction to death. And a lot of what we've talked about is common sense, hopefully, although I will say I more outside, you know, we, we're talking to a lot of LCM at Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod audience, although, you know, I think it applies broadly, but I, I think other denominations, some of the stuff we're talking about isn't always common sense. There are a lot of good ones, but there are some really legalistic or um, judgmental circles, and it can happen anywhere. It's not denomination specific. Um, and, you know, Lutherans can be judgmental about their own stuff. So sin is sin, you know. <laughs> this is true. But I think, you know, a lot of times, and we've touched on this, deconstruction can happen because Christians don't reflect Christ. And, you know, any denomination can do it. Um, any religion can do it. Any non-religious worldview can do it because it's, it's sinful nature. But when people do it in the name of God, that, you know, we're talking about trauma, there's religious trauma and there can be teachings that poses God's teachings that can be toxic. There are attitudes and behaviors that can be toxic. And this is just very, it's very sad. Um, and I think, you know, in, especially in the U S one of the ways that deconstruction happens is through politics because Christians will take a, either a stance on politics or a tone on politics that people are like, there's no way that a loving God would talk about politics that way. And it drives people away and it's very sad. And I think, you know, American Christians, there's a lot of stuff that I think Jesus would, would be very, um, uh, he would have some reprimands for. I want to like tug on that one just a little bit though, because this is something I actually hear pretty frequently from both sides of the political aisle, that if Jesus were here, he'd be real mad at you guys for doing the things that you're doing. How do you know sort of where, where this faith falls? And and I, I ask that because this is, this is sort of simple math that even I can do. There, there are, there are two major political parties of note in America. Like I know that there are some third parties, but but really there there are two significant political parties and we belong to a church body that makes up something like 1% of the population. And in a lot of ways, uh I have I've watched sort of uh, my brothers and sisters uh, inside of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod speak in ways that that perfectly reflects a party even though they they belong to a denomination that says that 99% of America doesn't quite see the world the way they do. Like if if we're letting our our faith inform our politics instead of our politics inform our faith. You would think that we we would probably lean one side or another, but it would be very nuanced and, and certainly not perfectly aligned, right? Yeah, and um, I think there's a fallacy in saying that any political party is the New Jerusalem, you know? Right. The, the second coming is going to be what it is, but it's not going to be a political election. No. Though there'll and, be clouds, great glory, trumpets. It'll be, it'll be way yeah. cooler than uh, than this. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise, what are we doing? Um, but yeah, I, th I think you know. I think it's helpful to maybe deconstruct ways that you know, pun intended, deconstruct ways that Americans, since that's our cultural context, engage with politics, and especially American Christians in ways that don't reflect the heart of God, and to say, you know, how can we do something different? Um, how can we 
you know, where, if you've been hurt by this and you're saying, how can God say these things, do these things? And, you know, I think there's room for encouragement that, no, this doesn't reflect God. And if you're navigating this and you're saying, how should I engage with these things? I think there's, there are guidelines to say, hey, don't, don't follow the bandwagon of what's popular in the culture because it doesn't reflect Jesus. Mm-hmm. The way there's so many trends in culture that just in politi- political parties jump on these trends, um, religious groups jump on these trends, and they're just they're they're not part of God's design for the way people are supposed to relate to each other. But people are supposed to relate to each other, and that's that's actually what politics is politics is when you have two people trying to figure something out together that that's the word for it right right so how do we start to make heads or tails of this then yeah so um i think we could talk about it from a couple angles we can talk about it from like thinking skills kind of a cognitive perspective how do you think about issues and not get duped by some of the overly simplistic narratives yeah and then i think there's another bit which is what's your hard attitude and how that hard attitude gets reflected in your tone the way Mm -hmm. you post on social media the the news you watch and how you filter it, the way you talk to people who disagree with you at work or school, you know. So I think there's like there's a heart and a head piece to this, and I think we need to address both. Sure. So let's let's start with the head. Uh, that that tends to be our wheelhouse. Um, you, you mentioned sort of um, well, binary approaches. Yeah, I think there's a lot. Um, it, it drives me nuts because um, I had a really strong. Um, college education, um, got really good liberal arts training in terms of like how to see nuance. And then I watch politics and I'm like, this is overly simplistic. The opposite of that. Yeah. And, and I think there are a number of ways that like things get dumbed down in ways that if you're not engaging your brain, um, you, there could be problems. So I think one of the issues that is prevalent is false dichotomies. Um, I see this everywhere. Do you like black people or do you support the police? Do you support the unborn or do you support women? Um, So many of these issues where it's either or, it's like, wait a minute, why does it mean that if I support one group, I have to hate another group? Like, and, and there are a lot of these things where, you know, do I support immigrants or do I support, you know, national security? You know, so many of these things, the, the parties have taken a stance on one thing, and then they say, if you're not going to support us on this thing, then you hate these other people. And I'm like, wait a minute. Right. You can even sort of say there there are um, there's a side that needs help in this particular moment, and that's not a, a rejection of all the rest, and that's not a condemnation of all the rest, but just simply recognizing there's a mess here on the floor, and maybe we could help clean it up together, right? Yeah, and it... it it gets at, and we'll get to this when we talk about hard attitudes, but is your is the purpose of politics to bash people or is it to find solutions that work for as many people as possible? And I get frustrated politically because there are so many issues that are not getting addressed because people are busy fighting over stupid stuff. When, you know, I think there are some policies that people could form nothing, no policy is perfect. That's the other thing, all or nothing thinking, talking about critical thinking. There's this feeling where if I don't have a perfect solution, then it's a bad solution. And it's like, listen, we live in a fallen world. If you if you actually study political science and economics at, in, at college, you'll realize there's always downsides. There's pros and cons. There's trade-offs. You know, as an engineer, I deal with this all the time. If I want to optimize one thing, I have to sacrifice something else. And you do the best you can but you don't say if it's not perfect, then, you know, I'm a bad person, a bad policy maker because I don't care. Well, but but it's that word care. It, it, yeah. it's, it's that That's the word that's thrown around. I care about this. And why don't you care about this the way that I care about this? And that, that leads to not only sort of the, the false dichotomy, because like here we're going to get rid of all nuance because there's just this issue. Um, but, but also it, it starts to paint anybody who wouldn't care in the same way or to the same magnitude as as something other than maybe just somebody who cares about other things too. And we, we need that. We need to actually all have different things we care about so that, so that we can tackle more than one thing at a time as a, as a people. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. So that you're kind of getting into like, how do we look at other people? And I yeah. think maybe it's good. I mean, you could spend all day on political theory and logical fallacies and like, how do you dissect, 
um, issues. And I think there's lots of room for more critical thinking and nuance just in general. We can say that broadly. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the thing that really turns people off, especially to, to religious politics, is the tone and the attitude you take. Um, and what you said, I think is important where there's this villainizing that happens where anyone who disagrees with me is either a bad person or they're idiotic. And it, it's, it's it's sad because dichotomy too. Like you realize that, right? That, yeah. Yeah. It's basically saying you can't. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I think, you know, we were talking a little bit before this and there's this passage that was brought up in a sermon I listened to recently where they talked about when Jesus is preaching on anger, very relevant to American culture and politics. And he said, you know, don't be angry. And he says, whoever insults his brother is going to be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. And I can't vouch for this because this isn't my wheelhouse, but I, apparently in the original language, one of these things that Jesus was condemning was calling someone stupid and saying you're intellectually deficient because you disagree with me or you have a or you, you've offended me or i'm angry at you for some reason and therefore you're intellectually deficient the other one is saying they're morally deficient they're bad people they're villains and i see this way too often and there are tons of people christians on social media that i respect their spiritual maturity they're intellectually really sharp and then it's like when it gets, comes to social media or the way they engage publicly, um, it, it goes out the window. And it's, um, you know, look at the people the president has around him. He must be totally stupid, um, which is funny because the other side makes the same argument when the other party's in office. And it, it, you could almost predict whoever's not in office, you know, automatically who's going to like the president. You know, it's like, doesn't matter who they are. Um, but there's this sense of like, um, or, or the, so, so it could be like that they're, they're stupid and you make fun of them. Like they're, they're not good at what they do. They're really, you know, they're just, anybody with an ounce of intelligence will see that this is idiotic and you kind of puff yourself up and you make fun of other people who disagree with you. The other thing is you villainize, you say, if they have this view, they have a, this insidious agenda to destroy America. And that's the, the morally deficient. And there are cases where some people might have, um, there might be intellectual flaws with their argument, or they might, you know, there are bad people. There are people who have bad agendas. But I think there's this, the way dialogue happens in our society, there's just a lot of villainizing that is goes to the extreme way more than it's merited. And I don't think, this is the important thing, I don't think it reflects the heart of Jesus. And there, there's kind of two things that, that you pointed out here. First, uh, what we're talking about is called an ad hominem attack. It's when you set aside the issue and you attack the person stating it. Um, and and that, that's false logic. Uh, because like, look, if, if it's right, it'll stand no matter, even, even if an idiot says it. And if it's wrong, it doesn't matter if the smartest person in the world says it, it's still wrong. But this is also just sort of how we, we think. See, for, for us as Christians, right and wrong is dictated by the word of God. The Ten Commandments actually shape this thing and not the person saying it. Um, so to... to the world from an ad hominem attack. If the bad person says it, it must be bad because the bad person said it. For for us, we're going to take everything not to the, the source of, of who is speaking it, but to the source of who is giving it. We, we go to God's word. A and I would actually really love it if a side I didn't agree with actually said things from the word of God that I could agree with that then it would be right because not because they said it or didn't say it, but because it reflects truth uh, as is given to us by by the scriptures. Yeah, no, no, I think you, you, that's a good point from a logical fallacy perspective that there's, there is a lot of this ad hominem. But I think um, you know, from, a, from a, your heart attitude and the tone and posture you take, you know, Jesus condemned calling people intellectually and morally deficient because you're angry with them. Um, Peter in 1 Peter 3.15 kind of gives the contrast. How should we do it? If Jesus was saying, don't do this. Peter was saying, do this. And in 1 Peter 3.15, he says, be prepared to give to anyone an answer for the hope that you have. So we've been talking about apologetics in the past. And he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. And I think if everybody who talked about politics in America mm -hmm. stated their position with gentleness and respect, how much better would life be? And, um, and interestingly enough, 
I've read um, an exegesis of that passage or an interpretation of that passage that says, in context, the respect isn't so much respect for the other person as respect for Jesus, which kind of puts it on, on a whole new level. If you think the way I respect people who disagree with me reflects my respect for Jesus, um, I think we would think twice before bashing people who disagree with us. Right. That, that's simply even just starting with Jesus died for your enemy. And so you, you, that doesn't make evil into good, but it makes evil forgiven. You can look at a person and say, this is somebody for whom Christ has, has loved enough to, to bleed and die. Well, and that should shape things. Well, and, and you know, what you just said could be stated by someone. I'm, I know this isn't how you stated it, but it could be stated by someone in a self-righteous way where, well, Jesus died for your sins. I know you're a bad person, but God forgives you. And, and you know, Jesus talked about this. He said, um, you know, before you take the speck out of your someone else's, I look at the log in your own. Sure. You know, the, the same law that condemns other people condemns us. We are all under God's judgment. And if, and if we take that view, then if, you know, if we criticize someone else, there's, there's a finger pointing back at us saying, you know, what about your flaws? And do we really want to judge other people, to be judged by the same standard we use to judge other people? Well, and, and that's sort of the, the reality is it's not a question of do you want to, it's, it's that you will. Um, you, you will be judged according to the Ten Commandments through the lens of the cross of Christ, and and, and so will your neighbor. Um, so so faith is the only thing that saves. And this is why when we're given that passage, for example, it says first deal with the log that is in your own eye, not so that you can just leave your, your neighbor there with his speck, but so that you can you can help your neighbor. This is, again, actually calling us back to, to discourse, to politic, to love for neighbor. Yeah, yeah. So I think... Um... You know, a lot of this is probably common sense, but um, it's worth saying right it's now. It's worth I, saying because there's just a lot, a lot of this common sense doesn't get applied. And there are, like I said, a lot of people who I otherwise respect. And then it's when they, when it comes to politics, I'm like, where did it all go? You know, I, th I think there's yeah. time for some self-reflection. And, and the thing is, it really, it, it does turn people away from the gospel. It does communicate the wrong thing about God's character to people who um, are watching. And it's just very sad. And so I think it's important to say, hey, this stuff might be common sense in every other area of your life, but let's take a hard look in the mirror and say, how am I talking about this stuff when, when it, you know, the rubber hits the road? Well, this is there's a reason for that, um, and it's it's actually called idolatry. Um, if, mm. if you can rationally and, and wholly act in in every other arena in light of your faith, but in this, there's something more important right now. Mm. If, if there's something that you fear, love, and trust in more that that you expect to fix more, that's called idolatry. And in a lot of cases, especially lately, politics has entered the realm of faith. It has entered entered the realm of of, of salvation. And there, we as Christians should be called to repent. If you're trusting in your politic more than, than your Christ, or if your, your Christ only exists so that your political party can win, repent. That's idolatry. Yeah. And related to idolatry, as we've talked about identity, um, you know, one, we could, we could talk about idolatry as like bowing down to golden calves and that feels very ancient and archaic and not relatable. And it's not, but um, <laughs> idolatry is in a, I think a way to frame it in like modern culture would be to say, where do you say, this is my sense of self-worth and validation and who I am. Mm -hmm. And if that's not the grace of God, then there are going to be problems. Yeah. And this is something we all struggle with. I can say, you know, my value comes from um, my work. It comes from my significant other. It comes from my family. It comes from the validation of my friends. And something that doesn't get talked enough about in the Christian church is how we can have the idolatry of our ministry. Um, you know, there's this sense of, well, I'm doing this stuff for God and making a difference. So that's why I matter. Um, but I think it can happen in politics big time where there's this sense of um, my identity is wrapped up in what I, my stance and pushing my stance against people who disagree with me. And if, if you do that, that is idolatry and it's going to cause problems. I mean, sin always right. leads to problems and it yeah. tears people apart. And so I think that was good that you said that because, you know, the behaviors um, and the attitudes are symptoms of this deeper thing, which is like, really, where where's my heart? What am I worshiping? 
-hmm. What am I saying? This thing is really important. And if it's not um, God's grace shown in Jesus, then there are, there's going to be downstream effects that are toxic. And I think that's that's where the real repentance has to be. Right. I think this might be a pretty good stopping point right now. We could maybe tackle a little bit more into politics uh, next time if you're willing to sit down with us. But uh, thanks so much. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks, Harrison. Hey, have a good one. You too.